Okay. Yeah, there's a delay. All right, everybody, let's get started. This is Dave Vellante. Welcome to the Peer Insight reviewing EMC's VF Cash. Um, you can watch live on, as we were just talking, siliconangle.tv, uh, or you can go to the Wikibon blog. There's a widget there. It is on a delay, so if you're going to watch live, you're going to have to turn down your, your phone. So welcome, everybody. Uh, thanks very much for attending today. Uh, if you didn't see the announcement on the Wikibon blog, we have a very exciting um, news uh, that John MacArthur, uh, old friend and colleague uh, from my IDC days and many years afterwards, is joining uh, the Peer Insight team. John is going to be moderating the, the Peer Insights. So, John, welcome. Thank you, Dave. And we're joined today by Noemi Gresdorf, a Wikibon contributor. Noemi, thanks very much for coming on. You're with uh, Cambridge Computer, an uh, expert in many fields, and uh, appreciate you bringing the uh, practitioner's perspective. Thanks. So I am going to turn it over to John. John, why don't you set up the call, and we'll get into it. Well, as David said, we're uh, going to be discussing uh, what was uh, pre-announced as Project Lightning and which EMC uh, announced as VF Cash. Uh, David Floyer was on site in San Francisco for the announcement. And uh, so what we'd like to do here is, uh, is have him discuss what he saw. But before we get started, I want to remind everyone that the call is being recorded. For those of you who are tweeting, uh, please uh, include the hashtag uh, uh, for Wikibon, W-I-K-I-B-O-N. And, uh, and we do have uh, Noemi Graysdor from Cambridge Computer here, and David Flory is on the phone. Uh, so Dave, since you are at the announcement, why don't you uh, give us a quick summary of uh, what you saw, what you heard, and your, and your initial impressions. Oh, thanks very much. Can you hear me clearly? Yes. Um, it, it was a great uh, announcement uh, in uh, San Francisco, and the key announcements were two of them. Uh, there was Project Light, which is now being called, as you said, DF Cash, and Project. Hey, um, can I ask uh, folks to please mute their lines if they're not speaking? So that would be everybody but David Floyer. Uh, Appreciate you muting your lines, so I don't have to go through and mute them for you. And David, make sure your computer is muted. Yeah, computer is. Great. Carry on. Uh, so uh, there was the VF Cash and there was Project Thunder. So let's uh, just talk about VF Cash first. Um, that uh, is a uh, uh, Micron or uh, LSI ca uh, flash card, PCIe card. So this is the first uh, venture of uh, EMC into the uh, server side of storage. And uh, it's, a, it's a cache. Uh, so IOs are put into the cache on a uh, first in, um, uh, sorry, uh, uh, first in, first out basis, basis. And they revolve around the cache and they're kept there. And there's a piece of software, uh, a, a auto driver from EMC, which uh, decides what gets put into the cache. Uh, so this uh, speeds up uh, IOs. Um, the writes aren't speeded up, but the writes are, uh, can be written to the cache uh, if they're not sequential or large blocks. Um, and those are then available uh, for rereading uh, from that cache. So it's a capability of improving I.O. response time for reads in particular uh, and for uh, generating a large, much larger number of I.O. Uh, right, David, uh, there are um, a number of different use cases I think that you've identified. Can you just talk a little bit about the use cases that you see for this today in its current instantiation? The, the best uh, best use cases uh, for VF cache uh -huh. are uh, for simple caching uh, situations. So read intense workloads, <laughs> things about 50% read. Uh, for example, uh, I probably Exchange wouldn't be a best candidate for this, but for transaction processing uh, would be a, a lot of good candidates for that. A small I.O. size. Um, 64 KB is the largest that will be allowed into the, uh, uh, the uh, flash cache. Uh, is that a limitation yeah. of the card, or is that just a best practice? Well, it's a limitation of the card. It actually uh, doesn't allow anything bigger than 64 KB in it. Uh, that's to avoid sequential processing uh, 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 
overloading the cache. Um, so, in, but in general, small I/O size would be the, the right to, the use case anyway. So, uh, so um, this is a database uh, kind of application then, for the most part. Transaction processing database applications again would be the best fit. A random I/O, uh, obviously, uh, um, you know, random I/O is, is a is a better fit and, and more from transaction processing. Sequential I/O would not get much particular benefit as the, as the probability of rereading is usually much lower. Um, good and good locality of reference. In other words, does it have a, a small working set? Uh, of data, uh, which can be uh, which can be cached efficiently. Um, there is in VF cache a split cache, which means that you can put a particular volume uh, in that cache. Um, I, again, can the, can the participants please, if they're not speaking on the call, please mute your lines. Uh, if you don't have a, a sorry, if you don't have a, a mute, uh, star six will mute your line, please. I wouldn't recommend that at the moment because you're on your own for recovery. There aren't any in a single system, and if the system goes down, then um, you'll have to recover that. Okay, so 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 if you're using split cache and you write and you have an entire volume in the split. Cash, it's not protected. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. I'm, I'm sure that will come in the future, but uh, that's the situation. Okay. Um, David is Josh. You uh, mentioned a, tof a software that managing. Where is this software sitting? On the storage control unit, on or on the server? The the storage, the uh, the filter, um, the filter driver is sitting on the server. Um, it's in the operating system itself, and uh, that comes on to the next point. In VMware, um, the filter driver cache is, is, is in the VM guest and not in the hypervisor. Um, I'm sure that will come in the future, but that means that uh, even though there's a vCenter plugin for management, uh, it won't be, uh, it's used in VM motion, uh, will require scripting. And and uh, to to remove or or, or restore um, or add storage, and it's not yet you it's not yet ready for prime time with VMware. So yeah, we, so so you're not. Okay, if it is, but if it is sitting on a server, and which and the storage is connected by iSCSI or fiber channel or whatever, it means in fact that you can connect any storage. Is not limiting to, to uh, EMC storage, external uh, storage to connect. Right. Absolutely correct, and they and they and they have said that very clearly that this will this is useful for all storage, um, and there's no connection at the moment between fast as a management and the uh, and the VF cache. That's a, a future improvement that will come, um, and it will still work. Uh, even the, the the fast improvements are just hinting and um, and, and uh, uh, well that's the main one hinting um, for BF cache and that will still work with without that hinting. So in fact, it is third level cache of a server, which has very little to do with storage. Well, it's it. Um, I, I think it's important. Well, we'll come to that in a second. Um, there's just one more use case I want to talk about, and then we can talk okay. about the general use. Um, it, the other, the other thing is that it's not suitable for is a clustered environment. There's no support for clustering. Um, again, the, um, um, the 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 reason for that is that it's uh, it's tied to that specific. Uh, 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 server, and uh, there is not no cache coherency between that. The, these, these, the, the, the solution for a clustered environment is going to be part of uh, Project Thunder, and uh, we can uh, talk about that uh, going forward. But um, going back to Josh's issue, and that's a nice uh, lead up to what this means and the importance of it, this is 
they started with the server side. There is a um, split cache, so you can put volumes there. You can have storage there. Um, and this is a, a very clear indication of a trend from many, many um, uh, startups. Um, there's, there's, there's Viridian, there's uh, Versito, there's just a whole LSI, Warp Drive, Micron, Samsung, many, many players in this marketplace who have cards, PCIe cards, um, that will fit into the server and, uh, and provide this, uh, this type of service. So this is acknowledgement from a EMC, and for me, the most profound statement made by Pat Gelsinger at the, at the uh, uh, announcement was the fact that he, he said that the high-speed drive, the uh, high-speed uh, fiber channel and high-speed SAS drives, uh, their days were numbered. In other words, most of active data, all of active data, was going to be in flash in, uh, over the next. Uh, five years. And that, that means that EMC and everybody, every other server vendor has to compete uh, with storage on the server as well as uh, uh, Project Thunder, as well as providing uh, clusters. So, so I, uh, David, I, I read that comment as, uh, I read that comment as well, that I, he said high performance drives could be dead in the future. I didn't hear the five years. Um, I'm just curious on people's perspective on a couple of things relative to that. Uh, you know, uh, again, could uh, the people on the line mute mute their phones if they're not speaking? There's some noise in the background. Uh, the uh, uh, the question really being, uh, are are we how how much can we get behind that statement? Do we believe that? Uh, that uh, uh, fast drives are fast spinning drives are, are dead. Uh, Noemi, you're out there with customers all the time. I'm curious what you, what you see. Um, we do actually see um, quite a bit an uptick in interest in SSD technology for um, acceleration of performance. Um, but majority of areas where you see SSDs being adopted is um, wow, that's really distracting. So someone on the line is uh, is moving stuff or something. Um, we, I don't know if we can mute all of the lines if we have to, but there we go. Okay, it's gone now. Thank you. So, so the, um, the adoption is around more of a read type of workload. In terms of the writes, um, work, uh, write intensive workloads, you're still seeing um, demand for higher speed drives, um, more of the HDD side. Although uh, there's a number of solutions that are coming in the market that are claiming that they can uh, not only accelerate writes um, as well as they can accelerate reads on the SSD drives, but they can do it in a very uh, capacity, cost, uh, capacity and cost uh, efficient way. I believe that's still to be proven. Yeah. I guess the other question really is... I mean, it doesn't have to be proven in the sequential operation you read sequential into the cache, and it will be always faster than flash. And you you read uh, very long blocks, you know, and ahead of ahead of time. But the thing is that uh, if I remember well, something like 2007, Tucci said that there will be no no revolving disk in year 2010, and we are already 2012. I don't remember that statement. I, 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 I remember they announced in 2008 that when they started introducing uh, uh, solid state drives into their arrays, but I don't remember that statement, Josh. So I, do, I do believe, though, um, that if you look at the you know, performance characteristics of various types of drives, that the 15,000 RPM drive is definitely going away. We can see that already um, in terms of uh, the systems that are being deployed, um, leveraging SSDs has enabled organizations to do away with 15K drives and just go with either 7200 SAS, which are beginning to get adopted, or uh, 10,000 RPM drives. Just the difference in performance uptick um, and the capacity sort of trade-offs you get from 10K to 15K just don't seem to warrant it, especially if you offset that with SSDs. So in, in that regard, the market is definitely moving away from the 15K. I'm not sure about the 10K in the five-year horizon is, is really realistic. Can we, can we make enough? 
You know, just, <laughs> actually, this is this is uh, Barry Burke. Hey, Barry. I would, I would disagree with that assertion. Which one? The one that 15 Ks are going away and the world's going to 10 K and 7200. In a uh, tiered storage environment, it turns out that the delta of performance between 10K and 15K is big enough that um, you can't get sufficient performance out of your middle tier with just 10K drives. And uh, you really need to have a, a 15K spindle to kind of handle what you can't afford to put into flash. And in fact, if anything's going away, I believe it's the 10K. And we'll see 15Ks last longer just because of the performance profile. And uh, we'll have 15K in SATA for a long, long time before it, there are no drives. And then, and then, Floyer, you've predicted that the price of flash will come down at some point close enough to 15K fiber channel or SAS to, to kill it. Are you, are you still on that prediction? Uh, uh, absolutely. Um, if you take today's environment, there are some still use cases where the uh, high-speed drives uh, are useful. And, and the early implementations of, of FAST, for example, uh, by EMC have shown that uh, very clearly, that you, you, you need to have sufficient uh, 15K drives and balance the, the flash. If you project forward, though, just one or two uh, turns of the crank uh, on flash, uh, the ability of the flash to be written to and then uh, to, as a second stage, to, to, to uh, pass that down to um, high-capacity high drives will be uh, the way that large block files will be, or sequential processing will be handled, and particularly for things like log files. And the, the key reason for this, this movement down will be the fact that uh, applications will run much better, much, much better. Uh, locking will be reduced significantly if you can uh, acknowledge the rights as quickly as possible uh, onto, a, onto a flash uh, medium. Um, so that that within five years means that doesn't mean that all uh, 15k drives there will be no 15k drives sold because what we all know that uh, migration it takes it takes a long time. Right. There's um. There's, there's a, John. There's a, no. I mean, there's an irony here, and everybody on the on the line that I wanted to address. Maybe hit the escape key for a minute, and and this is the following that for the past 15 years we've seen function, storage function, move out, even 20 years, out of the host right. toward the SAN array, so the disk array, and then it merged into SAN. And EMC was a, the big reason for that. You know? But so things like snapshots and replication and data management techniques going into the, into the SAN. And, and as you referenced, John, I think 2008, EMC announced uh, what we call the haymaker, when, right. and surprised so. everybody with the inter enterprise flash drives inside the array. Fusion I.O. was just coming out of stealth, ironically, at the same time. And now we're seeing certain functions move back toward the host, the, pe the pendulum swinging. And uh, I'm interested in what people's thoughts are on that and what it means to practitioners in terms of how they architect uh, systems and storage. What we're seeing um, in the marketplace, actually, the... Um the adoption of virtualization, in particular VMware, who is the market leader currently, but in general, the adoption of virtualization has created um, an opportunity for deploying data management functionality in layers that makes most sense for that particular environment. So you're no longer tied to doing it in the storage array controller. You can do it in the network. You can do it in the host. You can do it in the hypervisor, um, which definitely gives you a lot more options. And um, the movement of, you know, additionally caching in the host and um, elevating awareness of this with the VF cache announcement, I think that's sort of validation. I don't think that all the functionality is going to sort of swing, the pendulum is going to swing back to all the functionality going to the host. But I do think that what we are seeing already is that um, folks are making decisions where that functionality should live based on their own specific requirements and having the options um, that were brought on a lot of, in a lot of cases by virtualization is enabling them to do that. I, I get that, but I also see that we've, got, we've had dramatic improvement in processor speed. We have not had have dramatic improvement in storage speed, and so we do sort of unnatural acts to improve speed. You know, uh, 
And, and the other thing that's happened is, is this price decline um, on memory so that now we can do things that, frankly, just weren't affordable. If you think disk drives were unaffordable or expensive, you know, wh when I left the user side in, in 95, um, uh, memory was a heck of a lot more expensive. Oh, so. disk, disk prices are going up for at least a period of yeah, time. Yeah, a little, so, little, little so, period of time. So what do people think about this? Maybe we should open it up yeah, to, the, to the community, to the audience a little bit, just get people's opinions. Why don't you want to restate well, the question? Is, yeah. Is this only going to be available in a PCIe form factor? Not available in place servers? Yes, so, so the initial, uh, uh, could you just uh, give us your first name? Yeah, David Stark. Oh, hey, David. Um, so, the, the, so the first implementation is a PCIe card. It's not supported in Blade servers. So, um, and of course, so I don't, I don't know what the, what the plans are down the road. Uh, is it, David, do you have any uh, insight on that? Uh, this is where Project Thunder uh, comes in um, as, as a much better way of, of dealing with the, the Blade type of environment. So Project Thunder is a, is a collection of, of, of appliances, um, with each of which has a, a, a CPU with a, with a number of PCIe cards, basically. So, right. um, and these are cache coherent and um, provide a layer, if you like, below uh, the CPU and, 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 and below device. the PCIe card in the in a server. Is it, so, yeah, it's if you have a blade server, right. then this right. would be they would, these would be connected directly via InfiniBand or or even RDMA. Yeah. So yeah, I had read so, I had read InfiniBand like, so. I, yeah. This is Abhishek uh, from EMC. Um, Hi, Abhishek. Hey, uh, so just to add to that, so the explanation for uh, Project Thunder that was given is one of the use cases, obviously. Uh, but in the meantime, we are also looking at uh, different options to uh, provide support for uh, Blade servers uh, using the current uh, v uh, VF Cache offering. Okay, so so you, so you that's something we are looking at definitely. Yes. Nothing, nothing we're announcing today, but something down the road. Okay. And I'm not sure if we address this, but I just got a, a direct message from somebody saying EMC VF Cache 64K limit. Uh, this is something we were talking about earlier. Right. Is the driver, not the card? I can't remember if we sort of specified it's not a card that. limit. It's a driver. Is it, the, the filter driver has the 64K limit, and that's you, uh, you had said that that's to make sure. Or David had said that's to make sure that you don't overwhelm the card with. Uh, no. With the, no. I don't think it's tied to the card at all. This is Barry again. The, the hey, Barry. limit is because the vast majority of large block read data and either a single shot sequential read for the purposes of backup or loading an application into memory. Um, and very rarely does that data ever get reused through all of our uh, millions and millions of IAP right. cases. We recognize that, so that's why the driver does that. Yeah, and actually that was one of the things that sort of went into some of EMC's claims here is that they've analyzed a lot of workloads and so the, their ability to make recommendations based upon the workload profile of the customer, you know, I think they've got a good competitive differentiator there. Um, so th there are a lot of ways to reach us for questions. Obviously, you can chime in online. If you want to uh, tweet us, um, I'm at D Vellante or at Wikibon. Uh, we'll, we're watching the stream. But um, again, any other thoughts from the community? It's a good time now. We'll just sort of take a quick breath and see if people have some comments that they want to make or questions that they want to ask. Yeah, hi, this is Alex Williams of, of Services Angle, and uh, I'm curious about the services uh, aspect to this story around via cash. It seems like there will be a major services component required uh, with this, and it seems to point to kind of a differentiation between uh, EMC's approach and PGIO's approach. And I'm just curious about, you know, your guys' take on that. When you okay. say a services approach, to, to, uh, let's make sure we're talking so about the same thing. The Sur requirements of, you know, the services integration, the need for um, consulting to some degree. In terms you know, of, what is right. the, um, you know, what, will, this, will this increase the need for services? How much help customers do we need? Right, so, so, so Dave, Volante was talking about uh, customers have a lot more options now, and, and I'm not sure that customers are necessarily looking for a lot more options. But if they if you do have a lot more options, that they're looking for better performance, and I get that. But if you have a lot more options, you better have a 
an awfully strong consultative services practice because let, let's say a customer comes to you and said, you know, I'm having performance issues with my Oracle database. I'm thinking you got six or seven or eight different options to try to address that uh, performance problem. Well, you know, um, on the wiki, right on the front page, uh, in the middle of the page, under professional alerts, you'll see under register now, there's a big orange register now button. This is on wikibon.org. Under professional alerts, the very first professional alert, it's called Wikibon Peer Insight on EMC Projects Lightning and Thunder. And in there, David Floyer has this just lovely set of charts sort of laying out his vision of the architecture of the future, real-time big data processing, um, and the different layers and where Flash generally and VF Cache and Thunder specifically fit. Um, and it seems to me, David, that that has services implications to Alex's question in terms of the processes and the procedures that I have established, maybe even certain application development um, uh, trends in terms of writing directly to um, new layers of, of Flash. I wonder if you could comment on that a little bit. Uh, yes, that's, uh, I, I, I think there's a, a, a very profound change coming. Uh, and I think that the best way of expressing that is that we're, we're entering an IO-centric era. Um, we, we will be able to afford very, very large numbers of IOs, which previously were orders of magnitude too expensive. Uh, and the solution to remo reducing the number of IOs was to block everything up and do, do everything in, in as big a block as you could. In, in an IO-centric environment, you'll be able to take very large streams of data coming in from, from many, many different sources and be able to do the transaction processing and, and at the same time sort out the, the data and the metadata and the indexes uh, in, in a parallel type process. Um, and that's that's a very different way of, of looking at it. And from a services angle, that's going to mean uh, a, a great deal of help in helping uh, uh, helping organizations restructure their whole thinking about big data and how to do analytics uh, and doing it um, top down as opposed to doing the transaction processing and then having the data on disk and then and trying to get it back again. Uh, so that's one area. Um, in, in terms of the options open, uh, this is a, you know, a very exciting time. There are a lot of different startups with a lot of different uh, products. Um, people mentioned Fusion IO uh, recently. Uh, one of the most uh, uh, really interesting uh, uh, evolutions has been the introduction of atomic rights, the, the ability to write directly to the flash from the uh, from the processor, um, and that's a, that's a game changer in terms of the number of IOs that can be written and the speed that that can be written to the flash. Uh, so there there are techniques of that sort which are changing. Um, there are uh, many 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 uh, flash only vendors out there. There's uh, Solid Fire and Pure and uh, Nimble and uh, Nimbus and many more and many, many hybrid solutions as well. So there's a, a host of, uh, of new ideas coming out and they're emphasizing a, a top-down view of the management of storage as opposed to the previous uh, more, more um, uh, uh, storage array up uh, view of managing it. So, so yes, this, uh, I think there is a, a tremendous role for services to play to be able to cut through the claims and counterclaims and make sensible, uh, practical decisions on what type of workloads uh, will fit what type of solution in the best way. David, uh, if I may, this is Barry. Um, just two things right. I'd like to call out. One is the original question that the VF cash card doesn't require any services to purchase and install or use. The services are available. So like you, know, you can just buy the card, pick in your server, and run. There's no prerequisite. And the second point I want to make is that um, the average read response time out of Flash in these PCI cards um, is, is relatively low on the order of a quarter of a millisecond or so, maybe even a little bit less than that. This is about the um, average response time of a large cache disk array for a write to cache. So 
So whether it be DMC, you know, VMAX, VNX, Hitachi, whatever, a write to cache is also about a quarter of a millisecond. So uh, in terms of, uh, you know, writing to flash at flash speeds, a quarter of a millisecond is far faster than you can write to any flash today. I think there's a little bit of a direction being put out there by uh, this, this right direct to flash thing being so fast. Uh, well, we can we can gently disagree on that one. Um, I, I think the uh, atomic rights to, to flash can go uh, much, much faster than milliseconds. You're talking about microseconds and, and a few of them as well. So, Clear, David, I did say microseconds. I'm sorry. And I know what flash speeds are for a frame of flash. You know they're not that fast. Uh, um, uh, the, 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 the rights to flash are still much, much faster than going through the I.O. stack and out again. Um, so the, 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 the opportunity... And IBM will disagree. I, th I think well, one of the, the things that... Marketplace will decide. I think one of the things um, that is definitely going on in the um, innovation community with all the new vendors coming out, um, and there are new technologies not only in the all flash uh, array systems, network cache um, appliances, as well as software that facilitates caching in the host. Um, I think across all of these um, innovators and all of these um, newer players in the marketplace, what is happening is that they're really working to design how data is placed on media with flash in mind. So they're taking the technology and leveraging it in ways that hard disk drives have never been able to be man, uh, leveraged. And they're coming up with some really interesting um, paradigms that enable them to uh, get more capacity, whether it's through, I don't want to call it deduplication or compression. There's you know, newer kind of techniques, um, how they do uh, rate protection. Um, even how they do uh, just general data placement, all of that is still in the early stages of development. And as that continues, I think um, I think there will sort of some very specific standards will um, evolve um, that will be to the benefit of the general community um, and the general marketplace that applications will be able to take advantage of. I mean, on the application level, though, we're still looking at things um, that administrators and application developers have to make uh, changes to their environments in terms of knowing that they are working, let's say, with flash technology that does have less latency, faster response time, you know, can handle thousands of IOs more than a traditional hard disk drive, and making sure that the application is aware of that so it can take advantage of that as well. Um, all of that is going to sort of optimize the general performance you can squeeze out of these drives as well as capacity. Things that we don't even think about right now. When we start talking about application rewrite, um, and, when, and I think about legacy applications, I start to get a little nervous. So um, I'm curious as to, relative to flash uh, adoption, what do you, what do you, where do you see it coming f uh, first? Do you see it in the new apps that are coming out, or do you see it in legacy apps? Uh, the, 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 the rewrites will be in the file systems and the database systems to take advantage of it. That will be the vast majority of the rewrite. Um, and that then will unleash capabilities, which will mean that uh, you know, applications will, will change over time to, to be able to take advantage of those. So we, ta we um, talk in quarters, years, or, or what? Oh, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. I okay. mean, the, 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 the technologies will start to be available in 2012. And you're, you're on a decade-long uh, uh, movement uh, to, to get to, a, to an IO-centric environment. The, the, you know, applications take a long time like, to, to change and to test. And, and the whole philosophy will take a long time to, to, to change uh, within organizations. So these things take, a, take, take time. But having said that, there is a huge opportunity for the people who take advantage of this uh, quickly to, to make uh, game-changing uh, alterations to the efficiencies of their organization and their ability to provide new services. So we're already seeing that the large 
um, social media companies, the, uh, the, the cloud providers are embracing this and finding new ways of doing things. So it's, uh, the Apples and the uh, Facebooks of the world. Right, but those are, are, new are, app, are newer, newer applications than the sort of traditional databases, right? So maybe we could reset here. Right. Yeah. Um, for those maybe just joining, um, we're talking about uh, the, the VF, EMC's VF Cash announcement, really a read-side cash, EMC's first entrance into the the closer to the server stack, right? We've been talking about that uh, uh, today. You know, initially um, uh, a, a read cache over time, uh, Project Thunder getting into a more shareable sort of network-oriented uh, approach. Um, so we've got uh, David Floyer on the line, uh, uh, myself, Dave Vellante, John MacArthur, Noemi Gresdorf, and uh, many hundreds of people on the call and on watching on video. So. John, yes. back to you. Well, let's 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 do that again and go back to the uh, to the listeners and see what questions or comments they have. And uh, you know, I think EMC's uh, uh, talked about several hundred implementers already. If we have any if we have any uh, customers that are using VF Cash today, I'd love to hear from them as well. Uh, I have a question. I'm not a customer that's implemented, um, but I have a question. If, if there are no other questions. Great. Go ahead. Your name. Our first name? Yeah, my name is Tim, Tim Samus. Um, so Hi, Tim. The question is, when will uh, will VF Cash and, and other systems like it, will they ever get integrated with the operating system? Because the operating system is doing its own caching. Now VF Cash is doing caching. And then back at the array, you've got um, caching happening at the array. So you've got three different engines, three different caching engines. When, if ever, will they be tied together so they know what each other, each other is doing? I think that's the idea behind, um, you know, the vision of VF Cache um, is that you have the integration with the backend array so that you can make smarter decisions about what is being cached in the server versus what may or may not be cached at the um, array level so that the resources can be more intem intelligently allocated to applications that need it where they need it. Is VF Cache aware of what the array is doing? Because yeah. it, I don't think it is, is it? Not today, but the at, idea at is the moment, moving forward. At the moment, no. it's not. Um, but but uh, uh, I, I think uh, it's a, an excellent question because it brings in uh, the the issue of uh, where the locus of control for that caching should be. Should it be at the uh, array level, uh, storage array level, or should it be at the uh, file system or database level? And I, and I think uh, 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 with, a, with a clustered support over a number of those um, of those systems. And I think over time, uh, the changes are going to be made to the file systems and the uh, database systems to be able to more efficiently cache uh, the data, being aware of the, of, of the, the flash layer. And those are changes, again, which will, are going to take some time to take, uh, to take advantage. So today, VF Cache is a simple solution, and, and, and it, there will be some uh, overlap on the caches, but it will still be uh, improved performance. But over time, it, it will become more efficient as it can be integrated into the operating system. And, I, uh, and my personal belief is that, 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 that those changes in the operating system and the database and the uh, file systems are going to be uh, very important going forward. Well, you know, David, we've probably got a number of different representatives from different uh, uh, factions of that stack that would uh, like to debate where the point of control should be, uh, you know. Uh, so uh, that's, uh, that's an interesting question and, uh, you know, one that we'll be following here. Barry again. Can I comment? Yeah, please. Um, I don't know that there needs to be a debate about where the control is, but I think we should all understand that while probably in the future we'll see um, things like the databases and file systems undertake advantage more of Flash as kind of a metadata or whatever locale or reference they need to, that really what we're trying to do here is to accelerate the utility and value of this new technology, Flash, to a broader set of applications that don't have to be rewritten to take advantage of it. And, and that's really what the VF cache model does. It's what putting flash in the storage arrays do. It's what putting, you know, caching devices in the network or an all flash array is all about supporting today's applications and giving them performance benefits without the rewrites that will in inevitably happen over time. So 
I think they're very complimentary, and we're just. Thanks. I couldn't agree more. That's, uh, that's very well said, uh, Barry. There's there's two forces. There's the forces of today's applications, and they need support and they need help. And uh, VF Cash is uh, is one of, uh, of of many, but a very good entry into the uh, into the into the field to help in that in that place. Um, so uh, the the discussion on the broader aspect is. Uh, is, is saying where that uh, ultimately where that uh, locus of control should be, and that, as I said, that'll take take a decade for that to move. In the same way that it took a decade for uh, the uh, migration to move uh, originally out to the storage controllers. Yeah, I think one of the things that we should probably bring into this conversation, um, outside of the technology itself, is the concept of cost. Um, that does play a significant role in how the applications are able to take advantage of flash SSD technology um, and um, how an end user who is trying to accelerate the performance of their existing applications without having to rewrite them um, can best get, I guess, the best bang for their buck. Um, and I think that uh, in terms of implementations, there are certain uh, places where you get better performance benefits, you may be trading them for um, maybe lower reliability or less functionality. Um, there are other implementations where you might have more redundancy, um, but at a much higher cost. So I think cost is a very um, important aspect of any discussion associated with the adoption of flash SSD, host, network, or array. Uh, Dennis Martin here, I wanted to make a couple comments. Yep. Go ahead, Dennis. So uh, on the question about integrating cache into the OS, I think that's a, a great question, and, and uh, there's two ways it can go, and these are not mutually exclusive. Uh, I think as we get more and more flash or flash-like technologies become more common and the prices you know continue to drop, uh, I think it'll be a natural for the OSs to begin to start thinking, well, if this is always here, maybe we can exploit it. Uh, coming from the storage side, like in the case of EMC, You've got Flash that can ultimately be coordinated with the with the caches that are in the storage systems. So you've got this. You can you can sort of draw a line all the way through from the OS through this caching layer wherever it happens to be in on the server side into the caching into the uh, storage side. And who knows? Maybe one day we'll get to where it used to be on the mainframe where the, the OS is aware of cache in the subsystem. So so there's there's all kinds <laughs> of ways this could go, and I think it's all positive. Uh, uh, secondly, on the comments about performance and all that, uh, obviously we're big promoters of Flash. We've, we're involved with, obviously, some stuff with the VF cache, and we're doing a lot of other things with SSDs in general. Uh, we do like the performance we see on PCIe cards that do Flash. Uh, we also have measured performance to caches in the storage sub subsystems using Fiber Channel or SAS or even 10 gigabyte SCSI, and we're seeing less than 100 microseconds uh, to writing to a cache in the storage subsystem. So there's a lot of speed out there, and I don't think it's, I don't think you can argue that Flash is is faster. Uh, you know, certainly a lot of storage systems have a lot of good speed, but I think it's all, it all works well together. And, and so I don't think it's a, you know, it's an either or. I think it's a both and kind of situation. Yeah, for those what about the latency, for, what about the latency, what about the latency issue? Can you make some comparisons between Fusion IL and you know, and we have cash in terms of latency. Even I.O. you know, says that the latency is the issue more than anything else. Uh, could, we, could, we, could you give us uh, your first name? These are good in both. Uh, you can look at our performance paper, and there's a comparison with VF Cash or Fusion I.O., so I, I take a look at that. For um, next generation cloud apps, would you say that your latency is uh, on par with Fusion I.O.? Uh, you mean for a VF cache thing? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, for for VF cache, yes. I mean, it's going through the the the, the very low latencies that um, uh, Fusion IO are, are driving towards are using the VSL software and and the atomic writes, and and those are not yet in in uh, as a product, a full product yet. So those are experimental things. Are but it. But uh, obviously, there are it, you know, there are a lot of cards out there, and a lot of differences um, um, between the cards. It, 
using it, the card, uh, and, and, and the, the major use of Fusion IO is, is for, for, for people like Facebook is putting the whole of the database there, um, or, or the vast majority of the database there. Um, and that, that, that changes things a lot because you then don't have any of the long, um, uh, the, the very long elapsed time. You know, the average latency is, is one thing, but you get the outliers uh, with uh, you know, uh, up hundreds of milliseconds that you can get once in a while, which can uh, which can really affect performance in a big way. So, you know, th- there are a lot of low latency implementations of Flash in general um, that are in the marketplace and and, uh, and and are being used. And you know, caching is 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 one solution uh, to the general problem of. Uh, as Naomi said, of, of, of speeding things up. Uh, it d- depends on the, the business value of the application and, and uh, the requirement for IOPS uh, as opposed to um, just um, uh, bandwidth. And, and I think the biggest change of Flash is not necessarily that it performs much better or latency is much better, etc. It's just the simple number of IOs that can be done beforehand doing ios was very very expensive and with flash you can increase the number of ios by orders of magnitude for the same cost uh, and that's the a very very uh, application design uh, a very big impact on application design and brings into play new applications which just couldn't be afforded going back to naomi's point just could not be afforded before yeah we're looking at different metrics in that regard most people, when they think of storage, they think of price per gigabyte. You know, and that's a very reasonable thing to keep in mind. Uh, we look at, uh, we're looking at two other metrics with Flash, uh, dollars per IOPS or price per IOPS and IOPS per watt. And when you look at those metrics, just like David said, it's astronomically bigger than what you get with hard drives. So there's lots of different ways to, to skin this cat with lots of different types of SSDs. And we're finding even that in some cases you can do better for some applications by not using a PCIe card, by using a lot of SSD uh, not very far away with a high-speed pipe in, in there because then you don't have to split your database up to fit onto the PCIe card. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of opportunity what, here and a lot of good stuff happening. What was that, uh, that last metric that you mentioned, Dennis? So there, there are three that we're looking at, uh, pr- price per capacity or dollars per right, gigabyte. Right. Second one is uh, price per IOPS. Got that. And the third one is IOPS per watt. Uh, of electric power use. Right. I would actually and add it. And you get a lot more, of course, for, for flash products in those last two categories. I would actually add a third one. Um, this is the one that I think is important when um, flash is actually used as the primary capacity, not as just cash, um, but you know, for storing data. Uh, and that is um, price per IO per gigabyte. Um, because IO per gigabyte, yeah. Because yeah. the the um, when you're buying uh, performance, um, let's say you have a certain set of IOPS that you need for your application, but you also have to deal with the size of the data set and certain um, form factors for SSD may be too small um, to hold the whole data set. So you either have to then work with tiering, which works in some cases, not in others, um, efficiently, or you then have to um, look at a different form factor and consider different densities. SLC has lower densities than MLC, but have higher reliability. I mean, there's a lot of considerations um, when you're talking about it. So price per I.O. per gigabyte um, is another metric, I think, that is important for end users to consider, and they do. Yeah, in, in a recent uh, posting that uh, I put up on Wikibon uh, uh, called... Um, um, a real-time IO-centric processing for big data. I've got a comparison of the costs in Table Three um, between the you know, dollar per rack and uh, obviously um, uh, the um, uh, the uh, flash is a, about twenty times two, twenty time, twenty-two times more expensive than that. Um, but then, if you look at the dollar per uh, if you look at the dollar per um, I, my op, I've called it, is it's about 2,500 times difference. And the dollar per terabyte, uh, it's much cheaper for, for disk. 
and uh, then MyOps per terabyte. Again, it's much, much cheaper for Flash. So you know, different use cases for, for Flash and storage uh, and, and different metrics that we have to use uh, in the future um, for, uh, for evaluating uh, <laughs> storage, storage systems. Okay, in the few minutes that we've got left, let me, let's open it up again to the community and see if we have any other questions that people want to chime in with. Or comments. Yeah, Steve Stark, I have a question. As far as some of the key milestones, uh, when will the any idea when the Project Thunder would be available? So this technology would be available in other than just rack mount servers, and also the milestone of when the integration with fast uh, technologies, so the um, BF cache will be aware of the cache back in the uh, EMC arrays. It, it, at the announcement, they indicated they'd be starting uh, uh, working with customers on Project Thunder in the second quarter, and that all of the things that they talked about would be available within 12 months. So we, we, I would expect that the, and, and, and EMC have, been, have a very good track record of, of meeting these types of, uh, of, of um, projections. So I would expect that there will be a steady drumbeat of of announcements over the year, uh, filling in pieces. For example, I'm sure that they'll fill in the, the piece by having some sort of solution with uh, the VF cache in the hypervisor that will come as, as a solution for VMware. And um, there will be a, a, a significant movement towards uh, a general availability of the uh, Thunder. Uh, within the next 12 months. And, and uh, Lightning was uh, in customer hands uh, pre-release for a good seven, eight months at least? It was in la late last summer, I believe, at yeah. uh, Oracle uh, Open World. Uh, Gelsinger and Chad Sakic announced uh, they were in beta. They were so, in beta, so they were in yeah. alpha before that, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Yep. So I would so, expect uh, uh, maybe something at VMworld this summer, some kind of announcement. That effect. Go ahead, somebody. Uh, just a just a quick addition to it. This is Abhishek. Um, so, uh, don't associate uh, support for VF cache in Blade servers with Project Thunder. Uh, as I said earlier, yeah. uh, that is one of the use case for Thunder. Um, but going forward, we are looking at other options to start supporting uh, Blade servers earlier than availability of uh, Project Thunder. Oh, before that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Very helpful. Any other questions? And uh, there was one more comment about uh, support on hypervisor. Yeah. Uh, so uh, today we do support uh, VF cache in VMware environments. And uh, obviously we are looking to add more uh, functionalities as we go on. But yes, today we uh, do support it on 4.1 and 5.0 yeah, uh, VMware think, environments. And I, so I, I think the, the, the issue is that at the guest level, not and, and um, that 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 leads to issues in terms of uh, supporting uh, VMware tech, uh, capabilities such as VMotion uh, and things like that. VMotion, yeah. yeah. And you Understood. can and, and, and you can script. What, uh, Go ahead. And that's what that's what I was saying. Uh, more functionalities will be added in due course. But uh, right. yeah, yeah. And you and you can obviously script script your way around that, and you're going to I'm sure make it more automated over time. But uh, Okay. Um, that's good clarification. Yeah. Other questions? Any other comments? It's, a, it's kind of interesting as we sit and have this conversation because um, I remember somewhere around 1992 or so, we, although IBM was shipping system managed, was talking about system managed storage, there was a concept of symmetrics managed storage, which means if we just give you fast enough performance, your database administrators don't have to spend a lot of time worrying about data placement, and so we were able to sort of wrest control of data placement and free up a ton of capacity by just by by, by just guaranteeing service levels. So, I think the fast integration that's coming is going to be critical to being able able to deliver functionality where you don't have to sort of micromanage it. And the in the uh, I know Barry uh, made a comment about ease of implementation. I'm, uh, one of the things that I always think about when we're implementing new technologies into existing operating environments, you know, 
what does that process look like? And I don't know if there's anyone on the phone that can speak to that, but um, so we've got to take the applications down, or what, what do we need to do to be able to take advantage of VF cash? Oh. Uh, somebody killed you know, the other The other interesting angle here, and I wonder if anybody has a comment, is the whole investment climate. Um, there's a lot of action going on out there, and I, I don't know if um, anybody's yeah, got a... Dave, hey, Dave, hey, John. Hi, John. I haven't, uh, I'm uh, just calling in from Palo Alto, Silicon Angle, and I was at the event, and it was uh, interesting to see the uh, EMC standing tall and kind of, uh, they didn't really sp speak directly about Fusion I.O., but you know, David Flynn did issue a statement, um, so I thought that Fusion I.O. dynamic was really interesting at the launch, um, and uh, there was references in, in the EMC launch event in San Francisco around a slew of startups and other activities, and so... Obviously, it's very frothy right now in solid state. Anything with solid state is going to get instant funding. But what's happened is with solid fire and others really emerging, there's been a barrier to entry on the product side. So we're seeing a lot more product development on the mature funded companies. So what I'm seeing is the main dynamic is you got some leaders out there already, Fusion and solid fire and among others in the, in the solid state area. And all the new startups are trying to take a different approach on the architecture um, but all admittingly, privately, and I'm hearing from multiple sources um, here in Silicon Valley that most of those startups are um, su successful entrepreneurs doing another one in the storage area, and they're, they're doing parallel paths. They're also looking for venture capital while essentially selling their deal, looking to sell it. So we're seeing a lot of different dynamics that, that are going on, and that tells me specifically that the go-to-market path is not as clean as it was about a year ago. So um, that's kind of my report from the field in the sense of what I'm seeing on the, on the startup. So seasoned entrepreneur coming back in, viable technology, there's funding, but there's also these parallel paths going on, shopping their deal around. So is uh, VF Cash, is, is VF Cash, is that good confirmation for these guys, or is that, uh, uh-oh, look out? Well, I think it's like, you know, there's a lot of speculation that, hey, EMC is going to need to step up and buy a company. They could have bought Fusion when they were younger. Um, you know, they, they could have. Now it's kind of a little bit late. Maybe it's no, not too late in the public offering. But, uh, you know, I think a lot of people see EMC as a primary target to acquire uh, white space in this area. So there's a lot of go-to-market and accelerated timetables on the product side. If it doesn't material itself, itself in the marketplace, the M&A growth is going to be significant for the big guys not only EMC, but others who need solutions. So I think a lot of startups are kind of pimping themselves up to say, hey, we're a viable approach. We have an alternative. We have a different angle on it, cloud, mobile, social, new user expectations and applications, and position themselves that way, but also looking to be bought. So I think EMC's race in here is a testament to the marketplace. Pat Gelsinger and the team have rolled up their sleeves and they're they you know, got thunder right behind it. So EMC's not just mailing this in. So clearly that's a statement that, you know, there might not be enough seats at the table. I think that one of the interesting things about this market is that I don't believe that there is a clear leader. I think that there's a lot of companies, startups and young companies in general, who um, have been making a lot of noise and have very well-recognized brands but have not yet delivered the product, which kind of reminds me a little bit of the dot-com era where people were going, public without actually having customers. But um, besides the point, I, I don't believe that there is a clear market leader. I also don't believe that there is a clear um, preference or has been defined sort of, is it going to be in the array, is it going to be in the network, is it going to be in the host, or is there going to be some sort of a combination of many of these depending on the situation. Um, from a big sort of vendor perspective, um, I think that Jumping in is validation for, um, for the technology, for sure. Um, I don't think it obviates the fact that as these newer players come to market and start sort of executing, that the bigger guys are going to sit and wait and see who's going to execute well, um, who's going to come out sort of on top, and uh, those are the ones who are eventually going to get probably bought. Um, that's kind of what we've seen in the last um, decade. and. Even when uh, they have come up with their own technologies and their own products, it has not 
um, precluded them from, you know, four or five years from now changing their tune or saying, yep, we have this, but, you know, we're going to add this other um, technology to our portfolio because it has done so well. So, um, I would agree with you 100%. I think you're right on the money. I think there's a lot of still open book around what will happen relative to the architecture. And kind of what I'm seeing on, in, in, in the trenches is the definition and the ecosystem of what that stack's going to look like is changing. Uh, and a lot of forces are driving at this at the application level. Does it sit with developer frameworks? Does it move in closer to the server? It gets to sit with the with the arrays. So all these things are debatable and viable depending upon how you're looking at it. So you know, Fusion IO talks about performance, and they have a real viable story there, and they have specific clients implementing that. Yet EMC is clearly positioning them as a one-off early adopter, you know, fringe example. So. <laughs> you, know, you know, and I think with big data, you're seeing this data layer becoming a really key abstraction layer as middleware. So, again, application-specific acceleration, network, and then ultimately a server. So it's interesting. I think, Naomi, great point there. And I would gratify that, that still as the ecosystem of the NoSQL and the database wars continue, that will continue to be a viable discussion. Thank you, John. Uh, so the bottom line is... Uh, Flash is hot, EMC's in, a uh, lot of stuff coming down the pipe, but they've, uh, they've made their first uh, big stake here. I um, want to thank our uh, contributors. Uh, first of all, David Floyer, who, who uh, gave us the uh, quick overview. Dave Vellante, uh, do I have to thank you for being on your own show? Uh, Noemi <laughs> Graystorm, <pleasure>. thank you. <laughs> Noemi. Noemi, thanks for coming in. Uh, John on the phone. Abhishek, uh, Barry, uh, Tim. Alex, Dennis Martin, thank you, uh, Steve Stark, um, and, and I would encourage folks to take a look at the work that uh, Dennis has done. It's up, uh, I think you can link to it from the Wikibon site. Yep. Uh, Did you get Josh? Uh, Josh Kersher is on the phone. Thank yep. you, Josh, for your contributions, questions, and opinions. Um, just uh, to recap, we will have a... Um, We'll have six research uh, notes up uh, pertaining to this call up in the, ne uh, in the next uh, 24 hours. Uh, I'll summarize the call. We'll provide some implications on the IT department, implications for the or your organization, talk about technology integration. And we keep adding stuff, so hopefully we can get rid of some stuff. I'm not sure, <laughs> I'm not sure what. Um, all members of the Wikibon community um, are welcome to hit the edit button and contribute opinions uh, and improve the pieces. Uh, so we appreciate and encourage all participation there. We will have a, a, a podcast of, the, of this research meeting up on the Wikibon site within, what, 24 hours? Uh, yep, within seconds. Within seconds on TV. It's on uh, Silicon Angle TV. Silicon Angle, yeah. Angle TV. Um, I want you to also watch for announcements on an upcoming peer insight. Uh, we're just trying to uh, uh, close down on uh, getting some specific uh, um, IT professionals who've done the implementation, but I think we're going to have a uh, discussion regarding a black box for the data center coming up at the end of the month, and then we have another peer insight in, in March. It's already, uh, uh, already on the calendar. So please watch the Wikibon uh, page for upcoming peer insights. Thank you, uh, and um, I think with that, we'll say goodbye.